Thank you very much. I'm excited to be here. So part of it, uh, part of why I'm excited, uh, Normal, is uh, this is my second year speaking at All Things Open. So I was there last year uh, with thousands of people uh, at the event. And so it was pretty exciting to get to meet everyone in person uh, at that event. I'm certainly looking forward to uh, hopefully being there in person next year as well. So um, in this presentation, uh, I'm excited to share with you some of the cool research that we've been doing uh, over the past few years on high performance software development teams. And if you were at All Things Open and happened to see my presentation last year, this is a follow up to some of the research that we did there with a lot of new data and insight. So for the, uh, for the last seven years, I've been studying high performance software development organizations and software supply chains. And two things are really apparent from this. One is we uh, are more reliant on software supply chains than we've ever been before and faster is better. Let's talk about fast. So as we get into understanding kind of what's happening or what's really changed with software development, one of the things that, that I wanna focus on is this concept of software supply chains. Now, every one of you in your development organizations has a software supply chain. It is part of your technology supply chains. But in this case, specifically to open source, it really ties into you have suppliers of code out there. And these are either open source projects, could be developers that are creating containers uh, as well. They are making these components available on uh, in internet-based warehouses. So whether that's Maven Central, rubygems.org, python.pypy.org, the NuGet Gallery, Docker Hub, any of these are the component warehouses or artifact warehouses in your software supply chain. And then you as software development teams are consuming these components in order to produce your finished goods, whether it's uh, on-premises, traditional uh, software, or even software as a service offerings. And the, the thing that these software supply chains have enabled all of us over you know, the past decade or more that all of you have been utilizing them is that we can innovate a whole lot faster than we ever did before because we don't have to write this code ourselves. And if you're like me and you're following some of the research that Gene, uh, Gene Kim and Jez Humble and Nicole Forsgren have done in the state of DevOps reports and the Dora reports, uh, what you know is that the high performing software development organizations in their studies are the ones that are much more likely to be using open source and also much more likely to be expanding their use of open source uh, within their environments. And to give you a sense of how much open source is being used uh, out there, and these are, you know, when I'm talking about open source, not applications per se, they're being used a lot too, uh, but open source components or open source packages, binaries, frameworks, et cetera. So if we look at the, some of the stats that I've been tracking over the years from the NPM repository, they on a weekly basis were hitting about 25 billion download requests uh, from, uh, from the NPM repository per week back in the August timeframe. If you extrapolate that traffic out over a year's time, that means that this year there will be nearly 1.1 or 1.2 trillion JavaScript package downloads this year. So, a, a, you know, and to put that in context, there are only about seven and a half million JavaScript developers in the world that would want access to these uh, NPM components. Now, similarly, I've been tracking the download request traffic from Maven Central over the years that I've been producing the state of the software supply chain report. And as part of that, last year we saw um, just over 220 billion download requests of Java components from Maven Central. And this year, based on traffic that we looked at back, monthly traffic that we looked at back in May and June, 
we're going, we're projecting we'll see around 376 billion download requests in 2020. And again, there are about 10 million uh, Java developers around the world that would request these Maven components. So you can see the, the exponential increase over time, just when we think, oh my gosh, that's a huge number. I remember when I started at Sonatype and we had just done 13 billion download requests. I was like, oh my gosh, that's an amazing number. But seven years later, we're now you know, many, many uh, multiples uh, past that. And really what it means you know, for all of you as developers is about 90% of the code base in any given modern application that's being developed today is built from these open source components, code that we've uh, borrowed from external suppliers in order to build our products faster and with higher quality. When I looked across about 15,000 organizations that were downloading open source components from Maven Central, uh, I saw that the average organization in this past year was pulling in about 373,000 uh, Java packages or Maven packages to their development organizations. Now, these are not all unique packages. They come from about 3,500 open source projects. And across those projects, these organizations consume on average over 11,000 unique versions from those particular projects that they're, that they're working with. But not all of those packages are created equal. Around 8% of those downloads, or just over 8% last year, had known vulnerabilities associated with them. Similarly, on the JavaScript side, if you take that 1.1 or 1.2 trillion downloads that are expected this year of NPM packages and divide that by the number of developers out there, then what you're seeing is around 100,000 packages per JavaScript developer being downloaded annually. And depending on the research that you look at, whether it's NPM or there's some uh, university researchers that I'm also following, it's somewhere around 40 to 50% of the NPM packages have a vulnerability associated, associated with that package or with the dependency of that package coming into uh, the, the organization. So we just have to be aware that what we are consuming is not created equal. And in these software supply chains that we're working with, there are better and worse suppliers that we can be working with. But going back to the state of DevOps reports, what we know is from their research and people like Nicole Forsgren is faster is better in the enterprise and measurably better that these high performance development teams have higher uh, release frequencies they have faster uh, uh, mean time to repair uh, failures within their organization they have lower change failure rates etc within the, those organizations but these are really uh, external proxies uh, or internal uh, measures of performance and success. And, and I think when we look at this, one of the things that I look back to is a letter that Jeff Bezos uh, wrote to Amazon shareholders, I think it was in 2017. And, and in part of that letter, Jeff said, beware of the proxies. You can get so focused on we're fast, we're getting faster, we're releasing faster, we can recover from failures faster than others as internal benchmarks that it almost becomes the goal. But when we look at software supply chains and the components that are used within them uh, for your organizations, one of the other things that we have to consider are the external measures of what's happening out there. And in these environments, Faster is better not only for the enterprise, faster is better for adversaries. If you're an adversary out there and you're looking to breach an organization and looking for successful breach opportunities, you can move very quickly th these days. When it comes to open source, you know, we'll take a quick back look to 2017 where a struts vulnerability was announced in 
or a vulnerability was announced in the Apache Struts project. Uh, at the same day on March 7th, 2017, that a new version of Struts was made available. Everyone needed to update or upgrade as quickly as possible to that new version. And in the meantime, adversaries were alerted uh, at the same time, there is this vulnerability out there and they were racing to look for places to breach. Within three days, they breached Equifax. They also breached the Canada, Canada Revenue Organization, the GMO Payment Gateway. Uh, within a couple of days later, they uh, breached Okinawa Power, Japan Post, a month later, India Post, et cetera, where these, uh, those vulnerable versions of struts were not updated. Now, that was 2017, and a lot's happened since that point. So when we look at what has happened um, uh, since that time, uh, there's been a lot where uh, we do an annual survey, DevSecOps community survey that I lead of about 5,000 developers. And in 2018, the percentage of people taking the survey that said, we had or experienced an open source breach in the last 12 months was 31%, but you can see this steady decline in those survey responses since then. And I think Equifax was this watershed moment where people said, we don't wanna be the next Equifax. How do we invest in not being the next Equifax? And as a result, we saw this um, decline in, in behavior. But if you look back to just May of this year in terms of adversary speed when vulnerabilities are announced, there was a vulnerability that was announced back at the very end of April uh, of this year in SaltStack as an open source application. The very same day, April 29th, SaltStack released a newer, safer version uh, of that component. For those that were on auto updates, they received the newest version. But within three days from April 29th, which was a Wednesday afternoon when this was revealed, by Saturday morning, we saw 18 breaches on GitHub uh, that, that were noted through the various uh, comments in the salt stack uh, pages that were tracking this. People were saying, you know, my servers have been taken over, my firewall has been disabled, I'm seeing programs executing here that don't normally execute in these environments. And we saw other news that throughout the month, 27 breaches were tied to this. If you're an adversary, moving quickly actually benefits you uh, tremendously. And what we see through our, our annual survey work is that while the adversaries can identify where you're using certain open source components or open source applications uh, that have known vulnerabilities announced, we see that the average enterprise takes or about 50% of enterprises take a week to discover where vulnerable components have been used and then a, an additional week to remediate those vulnerabilities once they've been identified as to where they are. So while enterprises are investing in getting faster at identifying and remediating or fixing or updating open source components within their environments, the adversaries actually recognize this behavior of investment of everyone saying, I don't want to be the next Equifax, and they've changed their uh, attack vectors as a result. And so it used to be these kind of downstream, what I'll call legacy attacks, were the Equifax style attacks. Let's wait for a new vulnerability to be introduced, and then uh, we can go and try and find it before the enterprise development or enterprise security teams can catch up. What they found is that's becoming a lot less efficient of a path. So they're moving upstream within the software supply chains to look at where are the most popular projects out there? What projects are being downloaded by developers the most? And if I could come and contribute code into those projects, and in many cases contribute good code uh, or good changes to those uh, projects, at some point as an adversary, I can also contribute malicious code to those projects so that when the next version of the project is released, my malicious code is inside that project and uh, it's now downloaded tens of thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands of times 
uh, a week. So you could see that you know the top five NPM packages on this chart have a reach through their use as dependencies and other projects to you know over 150,000 other projects within the, the ecosystem. Also, if you were looking as an adversary to say, what if I gained access to be able to contribute code or stole the credentials of one of the open source project maintainers, in the top 100, you could influence over 50% of the NPM ecosystem by stealing credentials or by contributing into those projects malicious code that would perhaps go unchecked and then uh, downloaded by others within the uh, within the community. <clears throat> so we saw these patterns, we've seen these patterns of malicious code injection by adversaries very early in software development life cycles. And from May of 2015 to July of 2019, we saw about 200 instances of these types of next generation software supply chain attacks. But in my research this year, I uncovered an additional 900 attacks that happened in the past 12 months, or, or really from July 2019 through uh, July 2020. So we're seeing an exponential uh, growth in this attack pattern because the investments of, I don't want to be the next Equifax, have happened and the adversaries are shifting those strategies over time. And what they're doing is they're injecting malicious code that is either stealing credentials, stealing passwords, stealing money through cryptocurrency miners, uh, introducing back doors, or in some cases, like we saw back in May with the octopus scanner vulnerability within uh, uh, that was discovered by GitHub, I believe, uh, that was altering the uh, NetBeans IDE to actually do the injection of malicious code into anyone that was using the, the NetBeans IDE in that particular uh, attack configuration. So we've seen adversaries grow to be uh, more uh, cunning in their uh, approaches to attacking, uh, attacking folks. So we know open source or, or speed is better in the enterprise, faster is better in the enterprise. We know faster is better for adversaries as well. But one of the things that we wanted to do was go and look at is faster better when it comes to open source projects and open source project maintainers. So as part of work that I did with uh, the Sonotype research team, as well as Gene Kim, who many of you know, author of the Phoenix Project and the Unicorn Project, and Dr. Stephen McGill, who's CEO of a company called MuseDev here in the DC area where I live. Uh, we went and looked at over 24,000 open source projects. And we looked at these projects and their release patterns over a five year period to understand if we're going to rely on so many open source projects within development, would there be a way to characterize which are the best ones to work with? And a lot of what the best ones to work with have been historically are really defined by, well, I've used this project for years and it does what I need to do. It integrates with what I need it to integrate with uh, easily. Uh, or it's really popular. All my friends are using this, so therefore I use that version uh, or that, uh, that particular project. Well, we looked across different things like the size of the development teams, the popularity of the downloads, the average commits per month, um, how many different releases they were doing. Were they using continuous integration or was there evidence of that? When security vulnerabilities came out? Were they updating their code to remediate or remove those vulnerabilities? And what we found was pretty interesting in terms of the, the research. So we had a couple of hypotheses that um, one, projects that release better, so faster projects have better outcomes. We validated that. They were more popular. They had larger development teams. They were generally more foundation supported. Uh, one of our second hypotheses in this research was that uh, projects that update their dependencies more frequently would generally stay more secure. Um, the projects 
uh, that in the exemplars category, if you will, or the high performers, um, these organizations released faster, they remediated uh, vulnerabilities faster, uh, and they were also like, less likely to have out-of-date dependencies. And what this really meant was we, we looked at if projects had security vulnerabilities in them, how fast did they remediate them? But not all projects had security vulnerabilities and therefore we didn't have release patterns. So then we looked at the overall release patterns. And what we found is that the blue line in this chart is really um, how fast were you re remediating security vulnerabilities when you had them? The green line was how frequently are you updating or releasing new versions of your project? And what we found was there's a very tight parallel between remediating vulnerabilities and staying up to date. So even if you don't have vulnerabilities, if you're looking for the best open source projects, you want those that are staying up to date more uh, as a practice because those will also tend to stay more secure if a vulnerability is ever introduced or discovered uh, in those projects. Now, we look, also had some hypotheses in this research that we disproved. So uh, projects with fewer dependencies would stay more up to date. This kind of made sense. If you have a project that has three dependencies or you have a project that has 10 dependencies, it's gonna be easier to update three dependencies than 10. What we actually found was the opposite, that open source projects that had more dependencies were generally better at staying up to date. And this was, I think, in general, because the projects that had more dependencies tended to have more developers contributing as part of that project, and therefore potentially have more time or resource available to update those dependencies or to prioritize the effort of keeping up to date on dependencies. Uh, the other hypothesis that, that we had that was really important was that more popular projects would be better at staying up to date. And this kind of falls back to the Eric S. Raymond um, uh, Cathedral in the Bazaar uh, arguments that introduce with open source projects or open source in general with more eyeballs, all bugs are shallow. And we actually found that that wasn't particularly the case. So of these, you know, all these tens of thousands of open source projects that we analyzed, we looked at these projects in different ways to understand in this particular case, what is the release frequency of the, the project? So the further left on this chart, the faster your release cycles are. The further right, the slower you are at your average uh, release cycle. The higher you are on this chart means the, uh, the more popular your open source project is by number of downloads uh, that we were tracking through this, this research. So what we found was there, there were these, these projects that fell into these exemplar categories. And the exemplars were those that were releasing fast, updating fast, generally had the larger development teams, et cetera. And if you were going to rely on projects, these are the types of projects that you would want to rely on. Now, you can also see that there are a whole host of other projects out there that we identified in our research that were very popular, but also weren't very quick at staying up to date or updating their dependencies or keeping dependencies up to date using the latest versions of those, et cetera. So, you know, the, the research, and again, this is published, I'll share the, the more details with you on how to find them, but there were these attributes of best in class, high performance open source projects that if you're going to rely on 3,500 external suppliers that you would rely on the best in class ones within those choices. And by having attributes that help you make those choices more so than I've been using it for years or it's popular, um, that's the, the intent of that research. So we actually wanted to take this research a, a little further in terms of we know the best projects uh, are faster. We know from Dora and the state of DevOps reports that the best enterprises are faster. And we know from the previous research or the earlier research I shared 
uh, that adv better adversaries are faster in their particular business model. So we wanted to look at faster in terms of the enterprise when it comes to consumption of open source. And there is there's a fabulous presentation from uh, Eileen Yushitel at uh, who's at GitHub now. Uh, she was presenting at RailsConf uh, last year and gave this fabulous presentation on the effort that they undertook, which she was a part of at GitHub in updating from Rails 2 to Rails 5. This was a seven year upgrade process. And she talked about the pain of updating this project from version two to three to four to five, how long it took, how many, you know, they had their unique forks of Rails, then they wanted to standardize on the common uh, rails that everyone else was using. Uh, she talked about the challenges of keeping up to date with new security vulnerabilities that were announced uh, in rails, the difficulties of doing that when their version of rails was different than the uh, publicly consumed uh, version, how difficult it made it to hire people because they were again doing their unique thing and not something using, uh, using standard code. But, just how difficult that process became over time. So if you have a chance to look at that presentation, I'd highly recommend it. It's a wonderful seven year a, a summary of a seven year journey that you took there, but kind of looking at back at 90% of your application that you're building is code that isn't yours that you borrowed from these 3,500 suppliers and looking at these 11,000 versions and use we wanted to understand what were enterprises doing out there to manage their open source dependencies and to manage their updates or were they keeping up to date? Was there any automation within these, uh, within these processes that they could take advantage of? Um, were there any security practices to uh, move any vulnerable uh, or troublesome components out of their development practices as well? So. Um, Gene Kim, Stephen McGill, and myself went out and surveyed 679 different enterprises earlier this year, back in May, and we asked them about you know a variety of questions on their development philosophy. How quickly were they um, uh, developing or releasing new code? How often were they updating uh, open source and open source dependencies? Did they have policies inside the organization to uh, guide which open source they should be using. Did they contribute open source back into the community? So if they made changes within uh, code, was it contributed back up to the organization, uh, et cetera? And so what did we find through this research? I'm gonna walk you through some of the cool things that we uncovered as part of that research. One uh, is um, the leading organizations were, uh, 21% uh, of those organizations were deploying daily within the, the organization. Uh, we also found that organizations, 26% of these organizations had no ability to uh, approve new open source components that were coming into their uh, organization. So they could literally consume anything that they wanted. Uh, developer confidence was uh, that they were using non-vulnerable components uh, was only 32% of those said that they were using non-vulnerable components um, or comfortable that they weren't. 7% um, could find and remediate vulnerabilities within a day. If you look at how fast adversaries can go, um, you know we need to look at how fast are development teams updating and then how fast are the enterprises reacting. And that 34% of organizations knew where every vulnerable uh, component was with, or, or where every open source component was within their uh, enterprise. So this means that if any kind of troublesome component uh, or vulnerability was discovered in a component, 34% knew where to find that component. The other 60, 66% uh, uh, in this case would have to go on kind of a scavenger hunt. Did we ever use that component? Uh, if so, where might it be? But within this, this research, one of the fascinating things that came out of it 
and this is really one of my favorite charts from this year's uh, research report, was we found four distinct groups that were all about the same size in terms of they were each about 25% of the population, but they fell into these different areas of we had low performers. These were the groups that didn't release very fast and they also didn't prioritize security or risk positive risk management outcomes. You had productivity first groups. This is kind of what we call the DevOps group. They were focused on being really fast, but they didn't really prioritize security uh, as an outcome. Uh, for, for instance, in this group, um, they were able to use any open source component that, that they wanted, but they 26% uh, had no approval process for using those components. So they could move really fast to use whatever they wanted and security of those and whether they were good or bad wasn't a priority. There was also this security first team. This group was saying, hey, you know, I can release any code that I want, but I need to make sure it runs the security gauntlet and the set of security tests and priorities we have for this code before we'll release it. So we might not be fast, but we're definitely focused on security. And then you have the high performers, the DevSecOps group, which is which we're finding we can move really fast and implement security, uh, uh, positive security measures at the same time. And we started to look at the difference between these different groups. So the low performers and the high performers, what were the differences between uh, these groups? So one is the high performers were releasing 15 times more often than the low performers. When it came to detecting vulnerable open source components within uh, their environments, they were also 26 times faster at detecting uh, vulnerable components. They were faster at remediating those components as well. And they were also, when it came to time to uh, approve new components for use by developers, they were 26 times faster. So this, this was, uh, these were groups that said, we have some construct around what open source can be used or not used. Developers can't just use anything that they want. In general, we have a policy around what can be used or not, but the policy moves very fast, which also means developers don't have workarounds to the process that if you take five weeks to approve a new component, chances are a development team is going to find a workaround to that, uh, that approval process. And we also found uh, interestingly, that there was less context switching required or less time for context switching within these teams between developers moving from one team uh, to the next. Now, within, uh, within the study as well, we also looked at differences between what were the, these differences between security first teams and the high performer uh, teams. And we found some interesting differences here as well. So the high performers were more likely to be using software composition analysis. This is part of the application security portfolio that looks at issues or pro potential problems with uh, open source components and the quality of those. Um, they were definitely a lot more likely to automate their understanding and intelligence feeds to developers of are these quality components that we're using or not. Um, they were a little more likely, not significantly, but a little more likely to build that into their continuous integration platforms. Um, they were also more likely to use SBOMs. So SBOMs, if you're not familiar with them, are a software bill of materials. And this basically says, when we release an application, we take an inventory or keep a centralized inventory of all of the components used in that application. So we know whatever we've deployed or shipped, we know the ingredients list, if you will. We track that over time. And if things change in the quality of those components over time, we will be aware of that. So a security vulnerability that gets announced today, um, your question as a development team or even security team can be, do we know if we've ever used that component? And if the answer is yes, then your next question is where the SBOM helps you uh, determine where that organization is. And these organizations are also more likely to keep that centralized inventory of 
uh, of components out there. So this was uh, this is perhaps the best chart from the, the research that's in the report, and I'll share the report with you uh, at the end of the, the presentation. I'll, I'll share with you how you get a hold of it. Uh, but when we looked at these different clusters that we found, we did one of part of the analysis that we did was a centroid analysis. And that is, it's looking for kind of where are the most dots, if you will, in these clusters, where do they kind of cluster together as this is the average performance of this cluster. And so you can see the low performers down here, the high performers up here, but there's always been this kind of discussion of if you're a security first team, focusing on security, not necessarily speed, and someone says, we want you, we want to move faster and innovate faster and release faster as an organization. The security group says, if I do that, I may be less secure. And what you see is the security first green, if they move to the high performance category and took on the attributes of high performance, uh, organizations, they not only get faster moving to the right on this chart, but they also get a little bit more secure uh, as a result. Same thing for productivity first. This is the fast group. Doesn't necessarily emphasize uh, security, but this group, if they built security in, their fear is that's going to slow us down. And in reality, the difference between the productivity first group and the high performer group is that um, one, you're going to add significantly more security practices, but at the same time, on average, you're going to get even faster than you were uh, before. So that finding kind of, you know, uh, flies in the face of a lot of kind of myths out there that, you know, if we, you know, if we're focused on security and we go faster, we'll be less secure. If we're really fast and we throw in security, uh, you know, it'll slow us down, that there are the negatives that come out. But this research really quantitatively showed that um, you, get, you can get faster and you can get uh, uh, more secure uh, as you go along. So uh, some things that, that uh, just in wrapping up, um, guidance for enterprise development teams. One is creating a software bill of materials is critical uh, because not only can you track and trace what open source you, you've used, but if you have an inventory of the components, you can also begin to analyze what are the quality of components that I'm consuming and relying upon within my organization. Um, the other thing within it, uh, within this approach is to surface security data for um, developers in development tools. That security is not an add-on or a bolt-on to the end of a development lifecycle. Security more and more, and I think you, all of you that are developers out there are seeing this kind of come up organically within the, the market is GitHub or tools that you have integrated into GitHub are surfacing security alerts or security information uh, on your latest pull requests. Uh, there's a vulnerability in this code. We've analyzed the code. We're telling you early. We're not telling you in a separate third-party security tool, but we're surfacing that information in GitHub, in your IDE, in your continuous integration platform. So that information is getting to developers inside of developer tools, and that's a DevSecOps best practice that, that's happening. Um, the other thing is gates not, uh, or guardrails not gates. So don't set up security gates or blockers where security teams need to approve code. Set up rules and uh, guidelines or guardrails for developers that say, you can basically build anything you want, build with anything you want, any containers, any open source project that you want, but it has to fit within these bounds or criteria or guardrails. Uh, and if you do so, then you can operate very quickly with that security, uh, with those security rules uh, built in. And part of this is you also have to automate. You know, when we look back to the beginning of my presentation, where I talked about the billions and trillions of open source components being consumed. There's no way that you can manually assess the consumption of these components or 
uh, assess them for the quality of the components. Are these good projects? Are these bad projects? How many developers do they have? How often do they release? Are they well staffed? Do they upgrade, uh, update their dependencies often? That is impossible to do at the scale of consumption that, that is happening now. Uh, the, the other thing that I will say, um, one uh, re reminder to go back and watch Eileen Mugatel's uh, presentation, but updating dependencies regularly. A practice, you know, 25% of organizations out there are already doing this, have a regular update cadence for their dependencies, but the benefits that come along with this is one, uh, not only are you updating your dependencies, but you're probably more reliant on open source projects that are also updating their dependencies or releasing new versions. If you're trying to be on the latest version, but the projects you're relying on are not, they're harder to use as suppliers and you're going to look for other suppliers in there. We also saw that the projects that stay most up to date and release most frequently also ended up being more secure in general. So you also get that added benefit, whether you were looking for it or not, that by staying on the latest versions, you're going to stay uh, more secure uh, in general through your, uh, through your organization. So what did we find out through all this research? One, faster is better. Faster is better for adversaries. Faster is better for open source projects. And faster is better for uh, enterprise development teams. Faster also means that you end up being more secure as a result of these behaviors. And the one thing we also covered, and I didn't show you the research on this, but it's in the, the report, is the organizations that are the higher performing organizations, the faster organizations generally have happier developers. They're happy about their jobs. They can get their work done. They're more likely to re recommend their uh, employer is a place to work to their friends, so it's easier to hire. Uh, but who doesn't want to work in these environments where everyone's a little happier on average uh, than the others? So with that, if you want a copy of the research that um, I led and worked on with Gene Kim and Dr. Stephen McGill and a host of other security uh, and application and development researchers at Sonatype, you can get a hold of that um, just by emailing me today. Um, my out of office message is on. You just email weeks at sonatype.com. My auto response will send you a message and say, here are the links to the slides so that you can get them uh, available immediately. There's also a link to the state of the software supply chain report. Um, you can also drop by the Sonatype booth where we have these uh, available uh, as well. In the email, I also put a reminder at 4 p.m. today, if you have uh, time available, I'm going to be signing um, copies of my latest DevOps book, Feedback Loops, uh, Voices of All Day DevOps. Uh, we're gonna, I'm gonna sign 150 copies of these and then we're gonna send them to you at your house. So uh, you can sign up to be a part of that uh, and I will see you there this afternoon. And then Sonatype has a whole bunch of other things going on uh, at our booth. You can, uh, at our booth and in this uh, All Things Open community, uh, you can meet all of our development managers here uh, three o'clock today. We have a meeting. Come to our booth, check it out and find the location there. Also, Maury is doing a demo tomorrow at our booth of some of our new advanced development pack technologies, which are related to this topic as well of uh, how do you get better at updating your dependencies or knowing which ones to uh, do. We have uh, one of our customers that's speaking uh, tomorrow. And uh, again, I'm signing books at 4 p.m. So um, anyway, if you do want the, uh, the copy of the report, once again, just email. My out of office is on today. If you're watching this for whatever reason after all things open, not live, and you're seeing this and you email me, my out of office will not be on. So send me a message that says, hey, I saw that all things open presentation and I'd like the links uh, as well. I'd be happy to send them to you, but just give me some context if you're not watching live and sending me uh, the email. That's about it. And I'll wrap up there and we'll uh, get on to the next uh, presenter.